Welcome to the Gen Z Show. I am your host, James McClam, and I'm here today by myself without a co-host because I wanted to make sure that I got you this episode just as fast as I could. This is the third episode, uh, third recording, third episode in our social media series. And today we're interviewing Chris Martin, who's an author, a blogger, and has really spent his lifetime studying social media and its effects. This is a powerful, powerful interview that you're really going to appreciate. Chris gives us some great insight into how social media has evolved, how it has, how it affects us, and also gives us some tips on what we should do going forward to to work within the confines of, of, of social media. This is an outstanding interview. And I really highly suggest that you guys reach out and get his book, Terms of Service, which you'll see in the show notes as well. Well, with that, let's go forward with our interview with Mr. Chris Martin. Chris, welcome to the Gen Z Show. Thank you for agreeing to be our guest today. Of course, glad to be here. And our friend Will, uh, that we just interviewed on podcast previous, uh, connect us. So let's do a shout out to Will uh, for for connecting us. I love the fact when guests can connect me to other people that I need to know. Yeah, Will's great man. He and I attended college together up in Indiana, and uh, I'm glad to be in the same conversation as him on, on many of these topics. And uh, he's a great guy. And I'm glad you had him on the podcast. Well, thank you for that. Well, our audience heard a little bit about your story from us in the introduction, but they really want to hear more from you. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the Gen Z community. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name's Chris Martin. I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and um, went to college at Taylor University got an undergraduate degree in biblical literature there, studied a lot of different things. So that's the great thing about going to a liberal, liberal arts school is you get to dip your toe in so many different kinds of water. So took a lot of communications classes, took some, um, a lot of writing classes and just got to learn a bunch of different things. And, and at one point was an education major. So we even got some education classes and really enjoyed my time there at Taylor and, and learned so many different things. And um, then I graduated, got married shortly after graduation. My wife and I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, which is where we still currently live. I spent seven years working at Lifeway Christian Resources, which at one point was one of the largest Christian bookstore chains in the world and and is still one of the largest Christian resource uh, providers in the world. They create a lot of uh, curriculum for churches or books or things like that. Um, And then uh, while I was there, I worked in a number of roles over the seven years I spent there, uh, most commonly related to online content in some form or fashion, sometimes podcast related, sometimes like blog and article related, and uh, almost always social media related. Um, While there, uh, I was writing regularly and and active on the internet, creating content myself. And then I left uh, Lifeway in September of 2020, because frankly, for a large portion of the reason was because I wanted to get out of social media. Um, and uh, we might talk about that, talk about that a little bit, but I kind of become the social media guy at that organization, which is great. And I worked really hard to become the social media guy. Uh, but I just started to get really disenchanted with social media and didn't want to spend eight hours a day working on social media and decided I should probably go somewhere else because, again, I'm kind of the social media guy here. So I found a, another publisher uh, that really aligned with my values and my interests called Moody Publishers, which is based at the Moody Bible Institute in downtown Chicago. And I had heard of them, almost went to Moody for school, but at the time did not know I wanted to do something kind of Christian ministry oriented, so I did not go there. Uh, but I had a lot of friends who went there and, and loved the city of Chicago so much. So um, decided to go work at Moody Publishers, where I work as a content marketing editor. Uh, which is a very specific role and title that means a lot and nothing all at the same time. Um, I run a website called Bible to Life that helps people find answers to their spiritual questions on the internet. Uh, People are searching for all kinds of, uh, searching all kinds of questions related to spiritual matters, Christian or otherwise on the internet. And frankly, it might be hard to believe that even still in 2022, there there aren't a lot, a ton of trustworthy resources out there for, for some 
uh, kinds of questions that are being asked. And so we thought maybe we could create some resources online for people to access. On top of that, I also edit about half of the books that come through our publishing house. I edit them for theology and and uh, legal issues, things like that, permissions and such. Um, so I, I do I get to do a number of different things there at Moody Publishers, and I enjoy it. But I've uh, I write a twice weekly newsletter called Terms of Service, uh, which is about our relationship with social media and kind of the social internet more broadly. And um, I've written two books on social media, one of which is already published called Terms of Service, which will be, I think, what we're mostly talking about today. And a second book, which is currently uh, has been written, the, the first draft has been written and it's in editing right now. Uh, it is tentatively called The Wolves in Their Pocket, 13 Ways Social Media Threatens the People You Lead. Uh, so whereas the book we're the book we're talking about today is much more like kind of here's what social media is doing to you and me and what do we do about that and this next one the wolves in their pocket is much more here's what social media is doing to the people that are in your care that you're leading and here's what you can do about that um, so that's that's the next project that's uh, in the pipe right now and it's uh, it is baking in the oven really getting torn apart by my editor not really he's very kind but he's he's picking it apart and telling me where i need to strengthen arguments and all of that it should come out sometime in the spring of 2022 or 2023 now so so how does an editor feel about it being edited so <laughs> right it's like, right it's like you're telling the guy you don't know what you're talking about i'm an editor this is perfect you know how do you feel about that yeah it's funny you ask uh, it's i it's uh, I mean, nobody, most people don't like being edited or it's uncomfortable to be edited. So there, there's a level of discomfort. However, uh, I know it's incredibly difficult to edit yourself. So if you want to write a book, you better be relying on somebody else to edit you because it's really hard to edit yourself very effectively. And so I'm, I'm grateful that my book is being published with my employer. So the, the guy who's editing my book is actually a coworker and a friend of mine. So he's, He's gracious and kind, and he's actually like one of the funniest people I know. And so um, he, uh, I know he'll do a great job and won't be won't be too hard on me. So, so what, Chris? What was it that prompted you to write your first book? I'm going to put it up for our audience who's reviewing this to see. What prompted you to want to write this? The terms of service. Uh, I like the the undertitle, the real cost of social media. What was the catalyst of that? Yeah, uh, great question. I think what made me want to write it was well a lot of things made me want to write it james um i was working in social media every day uh so at the time that i wrote that in really i started writing it right around the beginning of the pandemic uh in in spring of 2020 um june june of 2020 more specifically and um i was working in social media every day at the time and i really i mean working in social media a lot of people kind of deride that or make fun of it or assume like interns run social media, which if there's any like if any major company is letting an intern run their social media, they're foolish and they should stop <laughs> because that's not wise. It's like, it's like letting an intern have the loudest microphone for your organization or something that just doesn't make sense. You could have maybe got away with that in like 2012, but these days it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so anyway, a lot of people just kind of like, you know, poke fun at social media or whatever, but like, you're really on the front lines of public relations and communications when you're running social media. So at, when I was head of social media at Lifeway, I ran the at Lifeway social media handles. Twitter had uh, almost 100,000 followers, Facebook, almost 300,000 followers, and Instagram, 20,000 followers or so. So I was running the at Lifeway social media handles. I had a friend helping me with Instagram. Um, and then I oversaw 60 different social media managers who were managing 270 social media accounts. So we had that many microphones, if you will, that we always needed to be uh, talking through and paying attention to. Um, and it was a lot. And it got to a point there in 2020 where every day, because of some, because of one PR crisis or another, sometimes, especially toward the end, relating to the coronavirus pandemic, um, it became, I get up in the morning, and I ask myself, who's mad at us on Twitter or on social media in general? Who's mad at us? What do we do about it? Are they right? Are, you know, are we wrong? Like, did we do something wrong? And, and now, and do we pay attention to it? Like, what do we do? Um, and I just frankly was starting to get really sick of that. Um, so, th so that was like one of the, I, that was one of the impetus, one of my impetuses for starting this book. Going back even further in 2017, I'll hold this up for anyone watching. Um, it's going to be mirrored, but 
uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. I read this book first in 2017. I'd read books by Neil Postman in the past when I was in college, but I'd never read Amusing Ourselves to Death. Neil Postman was a media ecologist, professor uh, at New York University uh, throughout much of the second half of the 20th century. He died in 2003. Um, he wrote a number of books. He wrote about education. He wrote about technology and he wrote about media. Those are the three things he primarily wrote about. And amusing ourselves to death, he's talking, I mean, the, the subtitle there is public discourse in the age of show business. So in 1985, that book is when that book was written. I read it in 2017. And it, when I read it in 2017, I was like, this book could not be any more relevant today than it is. In fact, I think it's more relevant today than it was in 1985, wow. because even though it, it never mentions social media, never talks about social media, it speaks to social media throughout. Um, and uh, he's primarily focused on television and how television, right. you oh, know, so given 19. 19- yeah, 1985. He, he has a chapter on the telegraph, uh, which is kind of a funny chapter. But you, I, I say I've joked that you could just replace the word telegraph with the word twitter throughout that whole chapter and it would be you could read it today and think it was written today um because it's it translates so easily but so much of what he writes about the advent of the television our obsession with the television in the 80s really does format to our relationship with social media today and so i read that book in 2017 and i thought to myself i thought well, I wish Neil Postman was still around today so that we could have his thoughts on social media because that would be super fascinating. We don't. Uh, because he died in 2003, we do have some thoughts on the early internet that he gave in some lectures, but we don't have a lot. Um, but I was like, and I wish, I'm, I'm a Christian myself, and I, I said, I wish we could have basically a Christian Neil Postman writing and speaking about social media in, you know, the 2020s. I think that would be a really helpful resource. And I was having trouble finding anybody who was kind of capturing that idea because Postman largely, his point is we're so consumed with being entertained that we don't care about what's true and what's not true. We don't care about what's wise or foolish. We just want to be entertained. Our hunger, our thirst for entertainment is so strong that we would rather be entertained than be told the truth. Uh, And it's going to it's going to destroy us. And like he, he contrasts Aldous Huxley and George Orwell. Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World, right. or George Orwell wrote 1984. And Orwell in 1984, and those books are written in the same year, roughly around the same time in the late 60s. And Orwell says in 1984, basically, uh, what you hate is going to destroy you. Like Big Brother, government overtaking, putting cameras in your house, whatever. Like 1984's thesis is what you hate will destroy you. Brave New World's thesis, Huxley's thesis, is actually what you love will destroy you. Uh, it won't. It won't be that there will be some outer governmental or mo- malicious force that comes in and destroys your life. You're going to fall so deeply in love with something that's destructive, but you're so blind to its destructiveness that it's going to your your embrace of that destructive technology or form of media or whatever else that's going to destroy you and you're just but you're so obsessed with it you're not even going to care basically and so what what postman says in amusing ourselves to death is he says i think huxley is more right than orwell uh he said i my concern is that what we love is going to destroy us much more than what we hate is going to destroy us and i think again he never mentioned social media because the book was written in 1985 but I think social media is a perfect example of how what we love is going to destroy us. We love expressing ourselves so much that we don't care about all the data we're giving up about ourselves. We love uh, being affirmed and pat on the back and told we're right so much that we don't care what's true. Um, we love, again, being right so much that we'll destroy anybody who dares say we're wrong. Um, and so that I think there are so many aspects of the social media experience that really really do kind of format to that idea that that Postman talks about and originally comes from Huxley that what we love embracing what we love and becoming consumed with it may be our end. And so I read that in 2017, started writing it occasionally about social media here and there. And obviously I was working in social media. So, um, and then as it got to later 2019, early 2020, I actually, I, I found a, uh, the other day I found in a notebook, like I, I write regularly, um, 
keep like I keep a mosque a miniature moleskin notebook uh all, all my notes to-do list everything goes in these things and I you know I go through a few of them a year um I found a ser- a, a a not a a, a book outline that I'd written during like a sermon on a Sunday morning at church about a, a social media book and I wrote it in 2018 that little outline and I came across it the other day um because when a friend approached me about writing a book about social media in early 2020 I said, oh, yeah, it's funny that you say that. I actually came up with an idea for a social media book a couple of years ago, and I went and found that notebook and pulled up the, the outline and kind of used that to start start off down this path of, of creating this book um, without knowing that I was ever going to do it. But uh, so, yeah, that's a little bit of, of how I got there. The, the Postman bit, especially in Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, combined with my own experience of seeing really the worst of humanity on social media, even from people who claimed a set of values as, as Christians uh, and not living those out in the social media space really just all kind of started to meld together. And I said, I think there's, I think there's a good bit that could be said about this. That's maybe not being said and I'm happy to say it. So. Well, you know, our concern here at Gen Z and and through generation youth, our, our parent company is, is focusing on youth. And over the last, I'd say two years, maybe two and a half, we're starting to see people admit the companies to admit, the social media companies admit that they are having a negative impact. And that's kind of what's prompted us to want to to do this and, and really just feeling led to do this, see, being discouraged with, with what I see at my own church, seeing even between services as kids are waiting for their life class to start, youth waiting for the life class to start, them sitting on their phones. You know, and I know for a fact they're not sitting there looking over the sermon outlines that, that was posted on the church's app. You know, I, I know that's not so what's happening. Uh, they're checking uh, their social media. So we've got the social dilemma that came out, what, two years ago. We got Facebook last fall finally admitting, you know, what what's happening here. So what are the premise, one of the sections of the book that you have, it talks about how social media shapes us. And the, the argument I hear, or the pushback, it's not an argument, the pushback when I try to talk to folks about social media is youth especially don't believe it's harmful. They don't believe that it is it is hurting them at all. Uh, gosh, there was a statistic that I had, and I, I wrote it down somewhere, where it was about two-thirds of, of um, youth either feel like it doesn't hurt them at all or it's beneficial. Two-thirds. And it could that number could go up and stuff. So how does it shape us? What, what are some of the effects of us? Yeah, uh, it shapes us in so many ways, James. Um, the I I only outline five in the book. Um, the five I outline in the book, I'll just rattle them off. First, um, our relationship with the with social media uh, leads us to believe that attention assigns value, and I can dig into each of these a little bit. But it leads us to believe that attention assigns value. Uh, second. It, social, our relationship with social media, and, and let me be clear, I'm going to say our relationship with social media does this because um, I don't want us to put the blame on social media. While, while I do think that social media companies like Facebook is the is the most egregious offender, in, in my view, genuinely an evil organization and company, but I have, I, I'm, that's a hill I'm willing to die on, but a lot of people disagree with me, and that's fine. Um, the Facebook is one of the biggest offenders of this, but uh, social media companies are are not neutral, and that's a that's a pushback that I often come across. It's like, well, they're just neutral, and our sin and our brokenness just, you know, is just amplified on social media. No, and I, I outline this pretty clear in the book. Like the the way these social media platforms work is designed to amplify brokenness and and evil um they're they're not neutral that we just happen to use poorly but that's a discussion we can go down that road if we if we need to but anyway so it's it's our relationship with social media that produces these things not just the social media platforms themselves we should not place all the blame on them however they are to blame at least a little bit so our relationship with social media leads us to trade our privacy for expression um, I am shocked and appalled, frankly, at the amount of personal information and data that we give up about ourselves simply because we want to express ourselves. Um, the number of times I've seen people overshare on social media uh, because they just want to share something about their life that's in- intensely personal and perhaps dangerous for them to share, like like maybe harmful to themselves or their family um, for them to share that information 
it's crazy how much we're willing to put out on the internet when 15 years ago, if some, like a small aside here, my wife and I have a two-year-old daughter. We don't post pictures of her on the internet. Right. When we, when we made that decision two years ago, when she was born, people looked at us like we were crazy. And I was like, I understand. And I don't judge people who do it. Like there's not a, I don't think it's morally wrong to do it. We just have our reasons for not doing it because I study this stuff and I know how bad it can be. Um, But if you were to go back 15 years ago, even, and tell parents of two-year-olds 15 years ago, hey, uh, you're going to post pictures of your kid on the internet for the world to see. And it's going to be totally normal for you to do that. Right. And it's going to be totally normal for you to do that. And if you don't do it, you're going to be a weirdo. Parents back in 2007, hearing you say that, would have looked at you like you're crazy. Like, they like. We were we were just getting comfortable putting our credit cards into stuff on the internet back in right. two thousand in the early two thousands. So so anyway, there's the idea that we've gone from not even like basically when I was in high school thinking it's weird to post pictures of your kid online to today you're weird if you don't do it is shocking and and I have so many feelings about it. But anyway, number three, uh, we pursue affirmation instead of truth. So our our relationship with social media leads us to want to be affirmed and have our backs pat and our heads pat and be told that we're right and good, we seek that more than we seek the truth. And and obviously, like disinformation, misinformation runs rampant on the internet, and we gobble it up because it makes us feel good. Even it's like it's like candy uh, it makes us feel good, even if it's not right or good for us to consume, but we do it anyway. And the last two are kind of related. Our relationship with social media leads us to demonize people we dislike. I, often, I often also say it leads us to dehumanize the people we dislike. Um, and then when we demonize the people we dislike, that makes us feel like we have permission to destroy the people that we've now demonized or dehumanized. So we, we find somebody that we dislike, perhaps we disagree with them on politics or faith or, uh, some big other issue and we, we don't like them. So we demonize them or figure out a way to dehumanize them, make them, take the image of God out of them and make them no more than the sum of the views they have that we dislike. Right. And then we say, now that I've made this person less than a person, we, we would never say this, but we, we think this now that I've made this person less than a person, I'm going to do everything I can to ruin their lives. This sometimes expresses itself in what's called cancel culture, though it goes far beyond that. Um, I think social media has just put such distance between us as people that it makes it much easier to see an avatar on a screen as not an actual human being, which then makes it a whole lot easier to be nasty and toxic toward that person who's made in the image of God. And so those those are a handful of the ways that social media shapes us, our relationship with social media shapes us. And the reason I highlight those throughout the book is um, is because I think we often ignore them. Uh, I, I have this theory that there are two common negative postures we take in engaging with social media first and this isn't even in the book i didn't think of this until after the book was published but i think we either uncritically embrace social media and this could apply to all technology but social media is what i write about so i focus it there we either uncritically embrace it or we passively ignore it so you can just think about this in terms of social media like um you, you uncritically embrace something, you're like any new platform that comes along, any new app, any new feature on an app you already use just comes along. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Like, you know, Instagram introduces a new filter where if you give them the location of your house, they'll tell you how much it's valued at or something like that. Well, sure. I'll just, I'll tell Instagram where I live. I'd like to put that on my Instagram story or something, you know, or like that's not real, but one that's actually real is Instagram will allow you to put the temperature on your Instagram story. Like, let's say you're posting an Instagram story and it's like out on the lake and it's like, you know, 85 degrees and sunny. And you can like say where, like give them your, your, your location, like let them track your location and it'll pop up with like the temperature. So then you can put that on your Instagram story. Um, we, we willingly give that up in order to express that data to possibly sell too. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. But the uncritical adoption doesn't think about that. The uncritical adoption just says, oh, you mean I can put my temperature on Instagram story? Well, that's cool. That's a fun way to express myself. Who cares what data I'm giving up? We don't think about that. We just uncritically embrace whatever new thing comes along and we go along with it. That's an unhealthy perspective. If I would say 
the most common and especially the most common among young people. The other common way we engage with social media is a passive ignorance. Right now, this is the most common posture among older people. Um, you know, people who are at this point probably in their 70s and 80s. Most 50 and 60 year olds are on board with social media at this point. Like they understand that it's a big deal, even if they don't use it. Um, you know, back when I was a kid, you even had to convince 50 and 60 year olds that social media was a big deal. But these days, time goes on, social media users are getting older. It's more people who are like my grandmother's age in their 80s who are like, no, social media really is a big deal. Trust me. And they're like, ah, this is just some young teeny bopper fad, you know, it's going to go away. I mean, I, I got a job in social media in 2013. I was 22. And we had a, my wife and I had a very well-meaning family member who in 2013 said, Hey, said to her, not to me. Hey, do you think, do you think Chris should be getting a job in social media? Like, I think it could be gone in a couple of years. Like, I don't really think, I don't think it's a very big deal, which back in 2013, you know, I, I heard that she, my wife passed along that sage counsel from our, trusted friend and i was like well that person's really smart like he could be right like i don't know like this thing could be gone in three years i mean seems like a pretty big deal to me facebook right, you know time i had people say don't worry about getting on facebook get on the whatever the google platform was yeah google that, plus yeah yeah that no longer exists oh google plus will be the way to go facebook will be right. gone in nine months i'm like really? right <laughs> yeah and so so these things were still so new and it was all still so volatile that there was reason to believe even now looking back it looks foolish but there was reason to believe that these things could go in and out like the tide and you just really had no idea mm -hmm. um but nowadays the posture of passive ignorance this idea that um i'm not going to care about this stuff it doesn't affect me i don't really care about sharing my life on instagram all of like i don't care like i'm not saying people need to be getting on these platforms i think i think it's totally fair and even healthy to not engage on them at all which i'm sure you talked about with will but um i think we should still not be ignorant of them like i think it's unhealthy to be ignorant of them and to kind of brush them off like they're some young person fad um because frankly and this this might depending on who's listening i'll either get some some uh, head nods and amens or some, I might lose some listeners here, but like I, I work in student ministry at my church. I've worked in student ministry since I was a high schooler at every church I've been at. I've served in student ministry. I was even on staff at my church for a few years as the student minister. I have seen in the last five to seven years, I've seen more foolishness on social media from parents of students than from students. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so while social media is often branded as, and, understandably so a quote young person issue because young people drive culture on social media they are the power users and they determine the trends and the memes and what goes viral and what doesn't um i don't think young people are disproportionately more foolish than their parents are now young people are foolish on social media don't get me wrong like i'm not saying they've got it figured out and they're all like paragons of virtue i've worked with plenty of high schoolers who are definitely not however um it's almost like among young people, because they are the power users and because the majority of their social existence is on these platforms, for many of them, it's like they have a bit more of a keen eye to the negative side effects than their parents do sometimes. Now, what their parents have is their parents have age and like wisdom, like general life wisdom. But what their parents don't have is the sort of like digital nativeness that these that young people have now this is going to change and this is as somebody who works with young people and kind of generational stuff in general you probably get this this is going to change over time and this is what i'm frankly most encouraged about when it comes to social media like my book and a lot of my writing about social media can be quite negative and that's intentional because i think we're all aware of the positives but we need to open our eyes to some of the negative but i'm not a negative person or even totally negative towards social media the thing that i am most optimistic about when it comes to social media is time moves on time charges ahead there's nothing we can do to stop it and young people who are digital natives to these platforms like me i was using myspace in 2003 and facebook in 2005 we are quickly becoming parents and in not too long in a decade we will be parents of teenagers which means for the first time in history and I won't be the first because they're, they're quickly becoming like every day, they're becoming more and more people who are like this. But we're getting into a stage where for the first time ever, parents of teenagers 
used social media themselves when they were teenagers. That's right. never been the case. Right. Never. Like I feel my dad worked for IBM when I was a kid. Like he worked for a household computer company. I was, that's why I was on the internet when I was five, because we had a home computer before anybody else did. Um, but even he having his, his technical know-how and working for IBM for that long and all of that, even he didn't know what it was like to be a teenager with social media. Like he couldn't, my parents couldn't sympathize with that. Like they, they didn't know what it, what it was like to have to like socially perform once you came home from school. And so my parents are great. They, they were wonderful parents still are, but when I was a teenager, were wonderful parents by every measure. However, they had no idea how to sympathize with me as a teenager who's having to go through this life as a teenager, having to kind of always be on socially but that is changing. And as time moves on, more and more parents of teenagers um, will have been those teenagers themselves who, who know what it's like to live with social media as a teen. And that's what I'm really encouraged about. Um, well, do, is, you think, do you think, though, that social media will adapt? And, and the reason I'm saying that is because I think in terms of how Snapchat it became so popular was because as Gen Z and the younger millennials we're seeing the older ones putting stuff up that was staying there in the content staying on Facebook and Twitter and I guess Instagram to a certain extent. The in the Instagram had not really been known that long before Snapchat jumped in. We have a new form now. Snapchat that jumps in that say, like, we'll we'll promise you that it'll disappear. So it kind of adapted. So do you see that kind of trend happening as well? That because it's money, these people are gonna want to do something to bring bring these people in. So I, when I, when you said yeah. that, and I was thinking, I agree that we're going to be more cautious, but the people who have set this up got too much to lose, not to, uh, not to throw up their hands and say, we've lost this fight. Yeah. 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 You bring up a good point. And the um, it's true. Social media will ever be evolving. And when my daughter who's right now two, you know, in a decade when she's approaching her teenage years and I'm trying to wrestle with, when do I let her get on whatever form of social media exists? Uh, you know, in, in a decade in 2032, um, social media will look very different than it does right now. But I think the, I will, I think unless it totally changes, you know, and unless I, I think the, the lowest common denominator still applies the idea that, and Derek Thompson talks about this in his book, Hit Makers. He's the one who came up with this terminology, and I just borrow it and use it all kinds of ways. But he talks about how teenagers are always in the hallway. So I, I kind of talked about this a, a minute ago without using that terminology. But if you think about it, James, when were you in high school, James? Not to make you reveal your age, but when were you in high school? They know my age. If they watch this stuff. I graduated in 87. Okay. So when you were in high school, James, when you went home, or, you know, the other people in your class, specifically like the, the girls who were in your class, because they're much more socially oriented than boys are often. Um, when you guys went home from school in the 80s, uh, from high school, you you were safe, if you will. Even it, like, let's assume you have like a, a solid home life or whatever. You're not having to perform for like socially. Right. Um, you, you know, if you think about the high school experience, and this was just as true for me as it was for you, even though we were in high school in 20 separate, 20 years apart is like, you go from class to class and in class, you're not socially performing a ton. I mean, you are a little bit, but you're mostly like listening to the teacher, doing work, taking tests, whatever. But you, the, the social runways, the social catwalks are those hallways in between class or like the high school lunchroom. It's kind of where you're like socially performing if you will like you're you're trying to make friends trying to build your reputation with friends and then also at like school functions like at the football game or at school dances or, or things like that those are where you're on stage if you will socially performing to make friends uh get better friendships yada 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 well the thing is when you went home from school james in the mid 80s you got to go backstage and like let your hair down and not care about how you look and not care about how you sound. You got to stop performing. It was a, for all intents and purposes, a safe place in terms of you not having to socially perform. You got to come off the stage and go backstage. Uh, you got to leave the, the proverbial hallway. As, as Derek Thompson says in his book, 
today's teenagers are always in the hallway. They're always on stage. When they go home, they're on stage. They're on stage. They're they're in. They're back in the hall. They can never escape the tension and the social pressure that comes with performing in the high school hallway. They're always on the catwalk and always on the runway. This is why anxiety is through the roof. It's not because of the apps themselves. It's because of the constant pressure to always feel like you have to perform and create content that communicates something reputational about yourself and kind of keep up appearances in some form or fashion among your friend group or your prospective friend group. What I, The reason I say that is when my daughter is 12 and 13 in a decade, Whatever platform exists, whether it's Snapchat or 18 iterations of some app in the future, that's what she'll be struggling with. You know, whatever the form is, whatever the whatever the app is called and the, the logo looks like, my daughter, if she's on social media when she's a teenager, will be pressured to socially perform outside of the realm of the high school hallways, if you will, right. or at that point, middle middle school hallways. So yes, the technology is changing. And while I won't be able to identify while well, I was on this app when I was 15, the, the apps will be different. But the experience of feeling like getting home from school and having to still stay socially on is something that my parents never experienced that you didn't experience in quite the same way that that I did and that my, kid, my kids and current teenagers have to. You know, I... I love that. I love what you said about them having to be on because at Generation Ziggler, what we have had to do over the past almost decade now, we've interviewed, well, I've personally interviewed about 2,500 youth, asked them one question, what is the biggest problem facing your generation, your peers, you know, some form of that question. Whether it's in groups or one-on-one, informal, formal, it's about 2,500 is what the number the staff come up with. The three major issues that we categorize men is number one, they struggle with something to deal with their self image. Number two, they struggle mightily with relationship building. And number three, they struggle mightily with the ability to set goals in life or, or to actually have focus in life. Now, these problems are not new. Uh, when the pandemic started and my daughter was at home, we started watching morning television at 7.30 in the morning and leave it to Beaver was on. And so for like a Three month period, I've seen every episode of Leave It to Beaver. I know them all. They have the same exact problems that this generation has, but they don't have the mental health issues. And it has a lot to do with what you're saying is they have yep. they, they're able to relax, they're able to be themselves, they're able to decompress, they're able, they're fr- even their close circle of friends. I don't think youth today are allowed to be themselves very often around what they consider their friends. So, wow, what a powerful thing that t- teenagers, because of social media and the way it is, is are, are always on. Uh, so, so what do we do? How, where do we go from here? I mean, uh, Will said that, that one of the statements that he uh, got from you is it's out of the bottle. He's, you know, it's out, you know, we can't put it back in. So it's, it's out there. And I don't think there's going to be too many that have taken the route that he has that was on our last episode of purging themselves completely off of it. I don't think that's going to happen very often. There's going to be some, and they'll reduce, but they're going to encounter it. They're, they're going to have to. I mean, it, they, they connect with their clubs and schools and now through it as well. So what do we do? Yeah. Uh, so I, I mentioned the two. Um, the, the short answer is there's no easy answer. The long answer I'm about to give you. So um, yeah, the, I mentioned the two sort of postures that I think are unhealthy. One is an un- uncritical embrace where you just embrace any new feature and app that comes along. You don't ask any hard questions of it. Like what is the purpose of this app in my life? What am I hoping this does for me? You know, that's the unhealthy embrace the other one the other unhealthy is just passively ignore like ah none of this matters it's just child's play it's going to go away in a few years most young people don't have that perspective if anything that's more the older folks so i i advocate for a healthy sort of if you see those as like two ends of the spectrum like loving it too much or not caring about it at all a sort of healthy middle ground i feel is i've i've called it intentional engagement so i call it intentional engagement because you cannot be passive about it. You, because of our sin, if anybody's listening, it understands like humans are inherently broken. Like we're, we're bent toward ill rather than totally blank slate and neutral. Um, if we, anything we do, we have to be intentional about, or we're going to end up do, using it poorly uh, and doing it poorly. So we have to be intentional 
about our relationship with social media. We have to ask questions like, all right, I'm going to download Instagram and create an account on Instagram. What do I hope this accomplishes in my life? Like I've asked these questions before and like people just laugh, like what a ridiculous question to ask, which like, I understand that is kind of a ridiculous question to ask, but like, is it, <laughs> you know, like it, we should be asking things like, uh, what's the goal for my relationship with Instagram? Like, what do I hope it does for me? And what's my line that I won't cross? You know, if Instagram starts making me feel bad about myself and how I look, then I'll delete the app or, you know, like we need to set like, set ground rules for our relationship with these things. I I don't have a problem with like Will or others who have taken the sort of perspective of maybe it's just best to totally log off and delete your accounts. I think that is a totally fair and helpful response to these issues for a lot of people. However, I think if we come to this conclusion that if I just delete the apps and or delete my accounts, social media will go away and I won't have to care about it anymore. Uh were wrong. I tell this story when I talk about this. I speak with my 86 year old grandmother every Sunday. Um, I usually make dinner at our house on Sundays, at least many times throughout the week, but every Sunday usually. And I'll often call her while I'm making dinner. My grandmother has never used social media in her life. Like has never only recently has ever used the internet. And that's because we don't post pictures of our daughter online. And we had been mailing her actual like printed pictures of our daughter and she was like well if i get one of those iphones we can do one of the apple cloud photo things and i'm like you're right uh because i was doing that with my parents and so we actually got her an iphone so she can join our like apple cloud um anyway but she's never actually used like an internet browser yeah i know it's amazing i'm genuinely shocked um just how much she loves her great granddaughter, I guess. But but she she's never used social media. She's never used an internet browser, anything. Like if I sent her a text message, she wouldn't know what to do. So she's still very, but, but a solid once a month when I call her, she will relay to me something that one of her friends who uses Facebook saw on Facebook that she wants to ask me about, whether it's something about family or something going on in the world. Sometimes she has genuinely led, been led astray by fake news on Facebook that her friend saw on her Facebook page that then she told to my grandma who doesn't use Facebook, but she heard it from her friend who does use Facebook. And then she wanted to ask me about it. And I was like grieving because James, here I am. I'm like, my grandmother has never used social media in her life and she's just been duped by fake news She'll on Facebook. Fake like, time. yeah, yeah. So uh, if you get this idea that, oh, if I just delete the accounts, then I won't be affected. It's, it's, it's a fool's errand. Now, I still, again, I think deleting accounts can be very healthy, especially if you find yourself like hopelessly addicted, et cetera. I think it can be very healthy. But I think if you think that's like how you solve the problem, um, so people are still gonna say, hey, can I, can I send this to you on Instagram? Can we set up this event on Facebook? Can you RSVP, you know, through another social media platform, whatever? Um, it's always going to be a part of our social lives. And so um, I think turning off or deleting is not a sort of like silver bullet, if you will. I think it can be very healthy and I think it's very good, but I think uh, we should stay away from it as a silver bullet. So what do we do? I think we approach it with a sort of intentional engagement. Now, this does not mean you have to use it. What I mean by engagement, I just mean... Um, if you're using it, be intentional. If you decide to opt out, like perhaps you're like, I'm only going to use uh, Twitter. I don't want to use any other social media platform because I don't like how Facebook harvests my data. I don't like the shady stuff that can happen on Snapchat, whatever else. You're like, I'm only going to use Twitter. That's great. Just set ground rules. And maybe like if you have the ability on your phone, set a, a time limit each day to where you can only use it for 30 minutes and only maybe only during certain hours of the day. Um, ask yourself, what do I hope Twitter accomplishes? Uh, never follow people who make you mad. Like there's no obligation you have to follow people with whom you disagree. Yeah. Um, now also don't follow people who demonize the people that you don't like either. But like I, I use Twitter and I've recently basically unfollowed anything that was making me mad. And just like, I want to follow people who are funny, who talk about sports, who would, I don't have to, sometimes people will complain like Twitter is such a negative place. I'm like, that's a you problem and who you follow. Just like change who you follow and you don't have to come across all that negativity all the time. So anyway, I think I think there are a handful of ways we can f do this right. I don't think we're ever going to fix it. But I think the way we approach it, whether you're a young person listening or a parent of a young person, is just encouraging this sort of intentional engagement of um, when I'm downloading an app or creating an account, 
trying to understand what do I hope this accomplishes? What are some lines that like, I'm not going to cross? Like if this starts making me feel bad or if it starts keeping me up at night or something, then I'm going to disengage. I think one last thing is I would say you cannot do this alone. So whether you're a young person listening or a parent of a young person or, or somebody who maybe leads young people, encourage like accountability and community and friendship uh, regarding our relationship with social media. So we all need people in our, in our lives who can, um, who can hold us accountable to what we're doing on the internet, whether on social media or otherwise, but, but like who can come to us and say like, Hey, Chris, you posted this rant on Facebook yesterday. Like, what are you thinking? Like you should probably apologize to the person that you're ranting at or whatever. Like we, we need to have people who can call us out and hold us accountable for when we're acting foolish uh, and who kind of hold the keys to our relationship with social media and can turn it off at any time. Um, Cause we, we just have to realize like, there, there's a there's a point in amusing ourselves to death, and I really ought to memorize this quote because I paraphrase I paraphrase it all the time. But he's talking about like the nightly news postman and amusing, and he's basically saying like, is man meant to consume the entirety of the world's events in a half an hour news show? Wow. Like, is that really is that really good for us? Because he talks about just how anxiety inducing it can be to go from this war here to this injustice over here to this mass shooting here and how how awful that can be to try to do that in in 30 minutes published in 85 that was a good five years four years four or five years before the advent uh, the really the promote i mean cnn was around then but they were right it was not big in the mid exactly it was there but it was not big it was right so 90 uh, when was Gulf uh, per- Desert Storm one? 91, 90, something yeah. like that. That's when yeah. CNN, you know, being there on the ground. Uh, right. That Shaw guy, I can't remember his first name, who was there reporting, and you had the, their cameras out. You could see the missiles exploding and stuff. That's right. when that first happened, and that it went to a 24 yeah. hour, and, you know, the thing. So, like, obviously. Yeah, so he he's talking about the nightly news that you know that yeah. everybody watched on on the major news networks. But then you you map that out to cable news, and obviously, like, are we meant to consume the entirety of the world's events all the time? But then you just go to social media. Like, are we meant to consume the the deluge of content we consume on social media all day every day? The average person, according to most recent data I've seen from earlier this year, spends two and a half hours on social media every day. And some of that's social, some of that's consuming news and other such media. Are we really meant to consume that much media? It could really start to weigh on us. And so all of that's to say that we we cannot do it by ourselves. It's a having a relationship with social media is a burden that we should not bear on our own. And and we should try to walk that road with people we trust and who can hold us accountable in whatever ways we need to be held accountable. I, I you have no idea how excited I am when you were sharing what you said about intentional because the very first person that we talked to on our social media series was listing principles that he's teaching his 10 to 12 year olds as they're coming. And they, it was like you guys sat down and had a conversation. This is what we're going to tell James on the Gen Z show. Cause he, his principles <laughs> were be a good human who you follow, you imitate, pick three to five things that you want to be about on there and be intentional with them. I mean, well, that's what I wrote down. And then we were talking about needing accountability to help you through if it's a problem. So I'm like, did you guys like sit around? And it's because you're reinforcing it. And I just love how that happens. And then it's not like three different people doing three different things. And then I have to kind of bring it all together. It's like, there's a theme to it. The people who've been there, done that, know the way to do it. And that, that, that makes it powerful. Uh, to me, it's just uh, oh, I get excited about that. Yeah, it's great, and I I can confirm we uh we did not talk beforehand. So yes, it's it's genuine. We're and and that's, I'm I'm that makes me grateful that there are other people like this because you know it's even even with the connectivity of this of social media, I don't know everybody out there talking about this kind of stuff. So I'm glad I'm glad to hear that there are other people promoting similar ideas, especially among young people who are just getting into this space. I think it's extremely important. Uh, I I. I when you get the next book, let's get back together because I want to hear I want to hear that one, and I want to share more about that. I, I, this this is such a major issue, and I have a 22 year old who kind of uses it peripherally. She, you know, she's not. I have a you know 19 year old who I think is more engaged in it, and I don't think I did a good job on the front end because when he was coming through it, ours was more. You know, we we didn't understand it, and then I have a 12 year old who 
we're trying to guide that food. Let's be intentional. Let's talk about it. Let's say if you're going to do it and stuff. So I, I'm in all phases of this. And, uh, and, and I agree. We, we have to accept the fact that this is the technology that we're in. This is the world that we're a part of. There's no putting it back. We cannot run away from it. It's going to be a part of it. I love your story of your grandmother, how even though she's never been a part of it, it's affecting her. Um, that's that's uh, that's a powerful story there as well. So to, to let people know they need to be concerned of it so they don't have that passive ignorance of it and, and say that they are. Yeah. I, I really love it. How can, how can our audience connect with you more? First off, how in the world can they find this? Sure. Your book, well, any place... Service. Yeah, any place you like to buy books, you should be able to find a way to buy Terms of Service. It's obviously on Amazon. It's in some Barnes and Nobles. I've seen it in the wild, and and uh, but every Barnes and Noble is different. And so if you go shopping at physical bookstores first, good for you. Secondly, they may have it, or you may need to request it. So um, really, you can go anywhere. But most people buy on Amazon. You can find it there. You can just search Terms of Service and my name. Um, on social media is the best way to connect with me, ironically. And again, like I said, I'm not anti social media. So um, uh, Twitter is where I'm most active talking with people who I don't like know personally. Um, I on Facebook, I usually only connect with people I know personally, same thing kind of for Instagram. Uh, but on Twitter, I'm at Chris Martin 17. And that's where if you have any questions about our discussion here, or you want to talk more, you can find me on Twitter, and I'd be happy to direct message there or tweet back and forth with you. Um, and and like you have up there on the screen, uh, termsofservice.social is where I write my twice weekly newsletter. So every Tuesday is kind of an original piece that I've written uh, that goes out. And every Thursday is kind of a collection of things I've been reading, things that I found helpful or insightful in some way. Um, uh, just kind of, I, I, I always find it interesting to read what other people are reading. And so I like to provide some links to things that I've been reading. So I do that every Thursday uh, through that and it's totally free and available for anyone. If you, uh, if you're not watching and you don't see it up on the screen, you can also, if you find me on Twitter at Chris Martin 17, you can find my newsletter there as well, a link to it. So um, that's the best place to connect with me. And I'm happy to connect with anyone who, uh, who wants to talk more about this kind of stuff. Cause I love talking about it. Well, I love talking about it as well. I really think it needs to be something that needs to be a part of, those who work with youth as part of their toolbox to understand how to, I, I ran something recently that someone was comparing that we would never give the keys to a car to someone that we had not taught them how to, to drive it, that we had not taught them how to properly use it. And yet we're turning over uh, a device that can be more deadly to their health than a car without any kind of preparation at all. So that's, that is what is the catalyst of this. As we build this, this is a, this is not a one-time topic. I'm sure that we'll be revisiting this, especially as we start moving into a new type of social media that, that we could talk about for days about but the metaverse and virtual reality and all those things. So thank you so much for your time today, Chris. I, I really sure. appreciate this. And, and uh, it's, it's really taking a lot of notes here. <laughs> what I, did, I, I, did, I, I love uh, the, doing the podcast because I learned so much. I don't let the audience learn. So sure. I do, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, man. Happy, happy to talk about this stuff. Happy to come on anytime you want to talk about it. Um, I think like you, I think it's super important uh, for young people and, uh, and their parents and, and grandparents alike. So I think it's, I'm glad you're talking about it. And, and I hope more and more people do. It's funny that you said like, one last thing is it's um, a couple of years ago, it was harder to get people to talk about the, the, the downsides, the negatives of social media. But since if anything good has come out of the coronavirus pandemic, which it, it's hard to say anything has, but I have found that so many of us relied on social media so much during the pandemic to keep up with friends or family or even our local churches that some of the cracks in our relationship with social media were really made evident when we were re so reliant on it the last couple of years. And so I found even in the last year or so it to be a lot easier to have and, and, and a lot more welcoming to have these kinds of conversations than it was the two years previous. So I'm glad you're talking about it. I think it's super important. It's not always fun. It's not always cheery and, and fun to talk about, but I think Certainly it's one of the most easy. concerning. Yeah. I think it's one of the most concerning and, and worthwhile things talking about today. So I'm glad you are. And thank you audience for sticking with us and uh, staying with us. I hope you've learned something. Listen, someone that you guys know needs to hear this episode, needs to hear this podcast. So please like, share, and comment. 
all of the links uh, to his book, uh, to his uh, newsletter, where you can sign up and his social media contacts are in the show notes. So if you're watching on YouTube, look down. If you're listening, just go to your app and look at the show notes and you can find it there. And we'll be back again next week with another episode of the Gen Z Show.